This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider interview. It's a bit of a follow-up to yesterday's show that I did with Michael Spaggett on uh, the deep roots of war, uh, the idea that uh, uh, it's endemic or uh, systemic within the human nature to uh, create war. Ricky Rangham is my guest this time, and he has written much about uh, violence uh, and uh, uh, the goodness uh, within humans, and uh, I will be talking with him about all of these things in a moment. Richard Rangham is my guest. Uh, he is going to be talking with me about human violence. Uh, his latest book is called The Goodness Paradox, and it touches on some of the things that uh, 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 I touch upon uh, talking with Michael Spaggett. Uh, and I also want to just give him a few minutes to give a little background about who he is, uh, what his research over the years has been, and uh, then we can begin uh, our journey forward. So, uh, welcome, Richard, and if you could give a little praise on who you are. Okay, thank you, Dan. Well, um, I'm uh, I'm retired as a professor of um, biological anthropology at Harvard. Um, I retired last year, and uh, I started my life as a biologist. I was uh, trained in zoology at the University of Oxford. And um, for my PhD, I went off to uh, Tanzania and worked with Jane Goodall, studying chimpanzees. And that was the early 1970s. And my study was of feeding behavior. But during the time that I was there, uh, the research team <coughs> of about um, six students, uh, we were uh, suddenly discovering something rather dramatic, which was that uh, every now and again, the chimps in the uh, community that we were observing, uh, a community where all the individuals were uh, comfortable being followed by humans, uh, they would sometimes take us to the edges of their territory, and there we would see them engaging in hostile interactions with members of the neighboring communities, where, of course, the neighbors um, in some cases didn't know us at all, but in one case, the neighbors were individuals that we also uh, knew that the, the chimps were uh, used to seeing humans and uh, therefore our presence did not disrupt the observations. And so during the period of uh, 72 and 73, we were starting to see uh, observations which clearly were uh, very aggressive, where males from neighboring groups could not stand being with each other without some kind of, of hostility. And uh, in January of 74, just after I left, uh, the first kill happened in which males from one community killed a male from another community. So my exposure to this, I found very dramatic because I was already interested in the evolution of human behavior and I was very sensitive to the extremely strong claim of um, conventional wisdom at that time, as represented by the great Nobel Prize winning ethologist Conrad Lorenz, that to kill other adults, uh, to be aggressive to members of your own species, was something that humans did, but no other animal did. And then it turns out that one of humans, two closest relatives, does it. So that put me onto a puzzle for the rest of my life. And, you know, I, I think it's just been a fascinating uh, investigation as to what it means that chimps show this pattern of behavior very similar to humans. Is it meaningless or does it actually tell us something about our own evolutionary past? Well, and, and yeah. Pursuit of that, I've written a book called Demonic Males, Apes and the Origins of Human Violence with Dale Peterson. And, um, and something about uh, uh, ecology of uh, human social behavior, uh, Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human, and, uh, and now my most recent book, The Goodness Paradox. Um, and yesterday's show, I, I made a boo-boo. I said uh, pan paniscus, which were the bonobos, were the more, the less aggressive version, but it was actually pan troglodytes, I believe is how it's pronounced, which are the, that the correct. general yeah. chimps that are violent. Um, so let me start from there and then we'll work our way through uh, 
these themes of goodness and uh, war. Um, so when we talk about goodness, or when you talk about goodness, are we talking about it in the metaphysical sense, or are we talking about it in an evolutionarily beneficial sense? Well, I, I don't know. I suppose it's probably both in a way. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm impressed by the fact that humans are astonishingly tolerant, uh, unaggressive, cooperative, compared to uh, any of the species that are close to us. Uh, so, you know, we are like a domesticated animal. Mm. Uh, we're, we're like a flop-eared rabbit because strangers can meet each other and we just uh, shake hands and, and have a pleasant time together. So the, you know, the paradox, of course, is that at the same time, we have this tremendous capacity for violence. But, but the goodness is the uh, astonishing difference from other animals in the ease with which uh, people in their ordinary lives uh, meet each other and suppress any kinds of uh, irritation. Mm -hmm. um, what degree do you think that has to do with our neotenized features? Uh, because it's all often been suggested that human beings, uh, adult human beings, look sort of like chimp uh, fetuses or, or babies do in that we have neotenized these younger features, we have less hair, and, and so forth. Do, does the idea of neoteny play a part in this, do you think? Because, you know, clearly babies are not going to be organizing gangs. <laughs> right, right. Yes. No, I mean, I, th there is something in what you say. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, the comparison between humans and chimpanzees, I think, is a somewhat misleading one, because so much has happened in between uh, a, a chimp-like ancestor and uh, contemporary humans. But the really interesting comparison is between uh, humans and our immediate ancestors in the Pleistocene, which would have been a, an earlier species of Homo. So instead of being Homo sapiens, it would have been, sometimes people call it Homo heidelbergensis. Right. And whatever you call it, uh, you can see evidence of neoteny in that transition. Right. Uh, and essentially for the reasons that you're, you're arguing, I think, that um, when selection was favoring, a less aggressive type in the sense of less likely to lose their tempers when they um, meet I individuals on a daily basis, then the easiest target of selection was youth mm -hmm. because individuals that matured relatively slowly in terms of their emotional development were more childlike in their emotions as adults and children are more timid, they're more tolerant, they're less aggressive than adults. Uh, so, if we if we move forward in time from uh, the various homos uh, through the Denisovans and the Neanderthals uh, to sapiens, um, do we have any sense of a lessening of aggression between them, or is that just the, the remains too scattered to have any real conclusion? Um, th there is there is no uh, adequate hard evidence on that point. Um, what you can say is that the skulls of Denisovans and uh, Neanderthals and earlier ancestors were substantially more robust than uh, those that you see in our species worldwide. And there are interesting aspects that robustness because we can tie them to aggression. Yeah. You know, it's a correlation, but nevertheless, it's a pretty convincing one. And one dramatic one is the ratio of the width of the face to the height of the face. Mm. So relatively wide faces yeah. occur in all the other species and, and a relatively narrow face in Homo sapiens. And the, the narrowness of the Homo sapiens face has just been getting narrower and narrower since we can first be detected 300,000 years ago. Well, the reason that's interesting is because nowadays you can look at uh, individual men and, and the width of their face. And it turns out, amazingly, that there's a lot of evidence that the wider the face, then the more those individuals tend to be aggressive. Mm. Uh, well, obviously, it's not predictive, you know, I mean, you cannot take any individual man and say, oh, well, you must be aggressive because you've got a wide face. But nevertheless, the overall statistics certainly point in that direction. And here's one sort of you know, lovely, very simple example. Um, if you look at 
hockey players who are, of course, dressed up with a helmet, so you can't see their faces that easily, then it turns out that the number of minutes they spend in a penalty box is positively related to the width of their face. Huh. In other words, if they are more likely to get into a fight while they're on the floor, then the referee, who has no knowledge of this sort of social psychological relationship, uh, spend, puts them into the penalty box for longer. Mm. Well, so, let me just let me just ask then, because this would get back to sort of the modern idea of race. Uh, obviously, what we would call or has been classically called uh, mongoloid or negroid features tend to have flatter faces and and more wider spread out, whereas when we think of Northern Europeans, we think of that hawk-like, you know, Roman profile kind of thing. Is that, does that, is that, or is that just something that, that's the, the morphology of the skin and the muscles on top? Do, do black people and people from Asia, East Asia especially, do they still have that thinner face? Uh... Um, the, the, the width of the face is correlated with aggressiveness um, in, in, uh, both East Asians and Europeans. So, so that, that particular relationship is found there. But you're asking about the, the variation in the degree of neoteny. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know of any data that, uh, that looks at that from the point of view that people have, um, have examined it in the fossil record. Mm. So uh, I suspect that what you, you might be seeing is uh, something about the, the fleshy protuberances rather than the, the skull itself. But, mm. Yeah, but I can't, I can't okay. speak directly about that. So getting back to like the Neanderthals, famously in the way that they were uh, posed in museums for most of the 20th century, you know, they have the big uh, brows, you know, they're stooped over, they have the big jaws, you know, a much more powerful bite force than we do. Um, you're saying that that would have been, I guess, just an adaptation for more violence. So if someone knocked him, you know, socked one Neanderthal in the jaw, it wouldn't break as easily as it would, let's say, with us. Because I think I've also read that uh, Neanderthals uh, also had more of the, what we call fast twitch, mu fast twitch muscles. They were more muscular and stronger than, than humans, uh, homo sapiens, I'd rather. Uh, the gen genetics indicate that there were more fast twitch muscles in earlier species. I'm not sure about Neanderthals no. in particular, but maybe that's right. Um, so I, I think you've got to be careful about uh, the word adaptation because um, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the Neanderthals show adaptations for aggressiveness in the, um, uh, the robustness of their skulls. But whether or not um, the loss of that um, robustness is due to adaptation is not so clear. And here's why. Uh, the famous experiments by the Russian exper uh, geneticist Dmitry Belyev, who took foxes and selected for tameness. Yeah. And, and that led to a whole cottage industry in understanding what happens when you select for tameness in a whole variety of animals. And you, you always get the same thing, which is you get um, the what... Uh, we can call the, the syndrome of domesticated characters, the domestication syndrome, which includes a, a less robust skull. Yeah. And uh, it does not look as though that's an adaptation. It looks as though the syndrome of um, domesticated characters, and they include things like um, white patches on the forehead or floppy ears yeah. in domesticated animals. These are not adaptations. These are incidental consequences of selection against reactive aggression, of the, the kind of aggression that we're talking about. And, and no one knows exactly why. We, we have some pretty good ideas about why they're, they're being tested at the moment. Um, but basically, it's to do with the fact that in order to achieve an animal that has reduced aggressiveness, you have to muck about with uh, events very early in the embryo, and they have consistent knock-on consequences. And, and this is to do with the changes in the pattern of neural crest migration. So we'll get into the weeds on, on the biology, but uh, the great thing is that you can detect in animals that have been selected against aggression, this domestication syndrome. Yeah, and we've seen also uh, that uh, domesticating animals leads to what's called the cuteness factor, uh, that it does lead to more like cartoony looking animals, you know, a, a French poodle is more 
cute and cartoony than a wolf. And the, the, the same guys and the big right, right, and, right. Know, right. It's the neophyte and, that you yeah, were talking the, about. Right, right. And so, yeah. I, so when we talk about self domestication, well, th this brings up the whole thing. I've often thought, and just to get off topic, that uh, sexual selection plays a lot more of a, a role than uh, than we like to think, because when when we talk about you know why. Uh, are, are Europeans this way? Why are Africans this way? Why are East Asians another way? Like if you talk about epicanthic falls, to me, that seems to, would seem to indicate that there was probably some warlords that found women with, uh, you know, epicanthic falls sexy or more beautiful than other, other uh, women. And this perpetuated that. And in the same way, uh, you know, and uh, you can comment on that. And in the same way, maybe women just liked less aggressive males. And so they chose their mates, aside from incidents of rape, they chose their mates on who was more neotenized. So uh, what is what is, is your opinion on either of those two? Okay, so, so I'll pick up on uh, your point about uh, female choice of aggressive males. Yeah. And um, I'm sure that nowadays you're right, uh, that, that, uh, that female choice and male choice have important consequences, particularly when, for some reason that is probably initially mysterious, a whole group of women or a whole group of men start converging on the what it is they like. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have got to ask, why are they converging on, as you say, epicanthic folds or something like that? Um, but, but if we're going to talk about the selection against aggressiveness in the males, I think what we have to imagine ourselves um, doing uh, is being in a world in which the, the most aggressive males are physically very domineering. You know, nowadays, uh, there has been selection against aggressiveness in, in Homo sapiens, and that's included uh, reduced body size and reduced uh, degree of differences between the sexes. It's basically feminization. Mm. of the males. You know, the, the, we, we males are a lot less masculine and a lot more feminine than our ancestors would have been 200, 300,000 years ago. But when they were like that, I don't think that female um, choice could have had much effect no. because the males would have been such bullies yeah. that the, the question of who got to mate, which males got to mate, would have been determined much more among the males themselves than by female choice. Mm. And part of the reason I say this is because of what we see in the primates. You know, if you look at chimpanzees, if you look at baboons, if you look at gorillas, female choice, they try and, and have a choice, but it has very limited effect. It's clear the females would prefer not to be bullied by the males. And if you give them a chance in captivity, you know, they'll, they'll prefer a, a milder male. But in the wild, what happens? The big males intimidate them. So female choice doesn't have an effect and uh, you've got to look for the, the reduction in male aggressiveness in some other form. Well, let me, so you're basically arguing that uh, uh, earlier versions of Homo uh, were more sexually dimorphic then. So you- That's right. Okay, then us. Um, and, but to flip that on its head, um, Okay, so if, if the warriors, the big tough guys, are the guys who get uh, all of the women, the, 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 the cream of the crop of the women, though, then they're going out, you know, if, if we're with the rock people and we're going to battle the river people and then take on the mountain people next, they're going to be going on these holy pogroms or crusades against their neighbors. But wouldn't those males that are more feminized behind, wouldn't they have opportunity then to <laughs> pass their seed on to the women, you know? If these women don't like being bullied by the men, wouldn't they say, well, I like, you know, Grok because he's, you know, he's not, he doesn't beat the crap out of me. So, you know, come on over, Grok, tomorrow night, you know? Well, um, you, you know, you, you can probably construct some sort of stories for, for humans, but I think we have to go on by the evidence that, okay. that we see with the primates. And um, the primates have got intense intergroup aggression hostility um, with their neighboring groups. And uh, I'm not quite sure the scenario you were building there, but you know the fact that they're going off and beating up on the neighbors doesn't stop the 
alpha males from getting a disproportionate share of the matings and the, the subsequent babies uh, compared to the the, uh, the feeble males, the, the gentle males. So um, uh, yesterday when I spoke with uh, Michael Spaggett, I had suggested that uh, the percentages that, that you hear about uh, of Neanderthal DNA in modern Homo sapiens is anywhere two and a half to three, four percent or whatnot. Um, would that suggest, and he he kind of sort of leaned toward it, but would that suggest that uh, when sapiens came along, we didn't just interbreed with the Neanderthals? Yes, we probably did, but we basically wiped them out. We we were the cause of there being no Neanderthals today. And if so, um, and if we are more feminized Homo sapiens, um, then I guess the reason we reason we won, we just had we just had better, uh, more cohesive units where our intelligence was, was better, our, our technology was, was better, because if, you know what I'm saying? If Neanderthals well, yeah, were bigger so, and stronger. So what we're talking about is uh, the period um, around 40,000 years ago, which is uh, when the, the um, sapiens uh, were coming into Europe and uh, we're, we're meeting with the Neanderthals, and Neanderthals very rapidly dying out. Mm. And it's interesting that that prior to that period, uh, for some tens of thousands of years, maybe uh, sixty or, or more thousand years, uh, the Sapiens had been knocking at the doors of Europe and had been going in and coming back and so on, and been kind of balanced with Neanderthals. But then all of a sudden, uh, between forty and forty-three thousand years ago, uh, the the sapiens come in and just totally take over. So that's the you know the big picture, and people talk about the fact that the sapiens were in bigger groups and and just demographically swamped the Neanderthals. Mm. And in a, in one sense, that's probably true. You know, I'm uh, much more uh, ready to talk about uh, war and uh, and domination than some people are. Uh, it, it, it's quite true, we don't have any direct evidence, but we do know that Sapiens had the arrow um, as well as big groups, and, and Neanderthals, there's no evidence they had arrows, so they could fire at a distance, and, and that would give them a big military advantage. And we also know that every time any kind of uh, militarily superior force uh, encounters uh, a militarily inferior force in human history, we know the story. Yeah. It's, it's always the same. So you know, nowadays there's a, a great reluctance, I think, to think of sapiens as um, as you know, killing Neanderthals and taking their women. Um, it seems to be quite surprising a reluctance. It's sort of understandable in terms of wanting to to make sapiens seem like a nice species, mm. but uh, in terms of the comparative ethnography and you know everything we've known about history. Uh, uh, for, for forever, uh, it surely just makes sense that the dominating sapiens uh, were, were killing. Well, uh, what you brought up there about uh, Homo sapiens knocking at the door and then finally being able to kick it in and, and, and dominate and wipe out the Neanderthals, it reminds me, and just to digress for a moment, uh, there's I, I've read about uh, the theory of why, for example, New World bears, uh, brown bears, grizzlies are more aggressive than old world bears uh, in, in Siberia. And that is that when Beringia, when, during the last ice age, when Beringia was uh, the land bridge between Asia and uh, America, uh, three or four times uh, the grizzly ancestors tried to get into America from the Russian side, but they were repelled and outcompeted by what was then called the short-faced bear, which was a much bigger bear. And so with each time that the grizzlies tried every few thousand years when the ice would, you know, come wax and wane, the, the, the grizzlies tried to get a foothold in America, but they were repelled by the bigger and stronger bears. So the grizzlies got more aggressive and that nowadays uh, you can see grizzly bears intimidating polar bears uh, in Canada, but you don't see when polar bears meet old world, the brown bears, the, 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 they're not as intimidated and, and that's... How interesting. This, okay, I didn't yeah. know about that. Yeah. Well, this this is what I've read. I, I don't know it any further. So I'm wondering is if each time, let's say three or four times, that Homo sapiens tried to get into Europe uh, with the Neanderthals, 
did they get more aggressive each time, do you think? Uh, not only that technology improvement, but were they, you know, we're going to, you know, culturally get these people. I have honestly no reason to think that. I mean, it's no. not as if they were sort of strategizing. You know, mm. These are just people living in their small bands and just interacting with the neighbors. Um, so I, th th that seems to me to be imposing too much okay. uh, on them. So uh, you had briefly mentioned when talking about uh, uh, the Sapiens coming into Europe uh, about swamping uh, uh, the Neanderthals, uh, you know, in population density. And I'd spoken a little bit uh, of that with Spaggett yesterday uh, regarding the fact that, uh, getting back to this deep roots of war theory, that uh, a lot of the people, and I don't think there's that many, but the people who do uh, dismiss the deep roots of war theory will say that, well, we haven't found mass graves here and there and, 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 and whatnot. And, you know, if you go back 10,000 years, the population is maybe a million or so, so it's like one eight thousandth of what it is today, or something in that ballpark. And uh, so you're not going to find mass graves. But that's not. But if we're talking about small groups and percentage-wise, I, I don't see how that's an argument, uh, you know, against the idea that uh, our ancestors were aggressive. Especially when we see, you know, uh, in the Americas when the Native American ancestors came over. I mean, within a hundred. Uh, one or two centuries of their getting to certain areas, the, the they became the apex predators and wiped out other apex predators. So what is your take about population density and this idea about the roots of war? Well, I mean, um, yeah, yeah I, I basically totally agree with you. But uh, I, I mean, anyway, the nature of war has changed dramatically. So uh, you absolutely do not expect to have... Um, mass graves because there would rarely have been mass killings. Yeah. In fact, I think it's simply astonishing that um, I, we have this uh, extraordinary gravesite from, um, or, I'm not sure gravesite is the right word, but burial site uh, from Nataruk in Kenya, which you, do you know about this? No, no, go ahead. Well, in, um, uh, in northern Kenya, uh, there was a, a site which is very well dated at around 10,000 years old. So uh, well before agriculture came into uh, East Africa, uh, in which you have, I think it's 22 um, remains of, of 22 individuals with clear evidence, convincing evidence that uh, they were executed. Mm. And uh, so you have um, hands tied behind the back, uh, you have uh, these these bodies, you know, contorted into all sorts of positions, indicating that uh, they were tied up and then um, uh, beaten uh, sometimes. Uh, well, this is just an amazing thing because, you know, even though hunters and gatherers have got a lot of warfare in the sense that there are raids in which individual victims uh, get picked off and killed, then both a they're not normally going to be. Uh, taken away and buried in a way that shows uh, how they were killed. Mm. Uh, B, uh, when they are killed, uh, most often uh, it's just soft body parts and you don't see any evidence in terms of the, the brains uh, or you know, the, the bones. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, the, the notion that you will expect to find uh, in pre-agricultural times uh, any kind of um, evidence of mass violence is uh, just uh, not sensible at all. And the fact that we do find occasional uh, cases where several bodies that have been killed are all together is an astonishing sort of piece of evidence suggesting that actually there was quite a lot of violence. But, you know, the, the way that Hudson Gatherers um, have uh, warfare it's true that there are occasional descriptions of battles, but the great majority of interactions are not battles. They are surprise raids, they are attacks, they're ambushes uh, in which one side has all the advantage yeah. and they kill one or two members of the opposing side and then run away. Well, it would make sense, of course, because why? If, if I've got 10 guys and I see the other tribe has 12, 
I'm going to try to ambush them. I'm not going to go face them, you know, in a, a basically a fair kind of fight. You know, you want to get the advantage on, on them. Yeah, exactly. And, and But actually, more often, if, if there's 10 on your side and 12 on the other side, you just won't have an interaction at all. You just go home mm. because you don't want to get involved in a risky fight. Um, so let's then get to, to the idea of some of the reasons for war. When uh, I, I mentioned this with uh, Spaggett yesterday, um, there's certainly religion. There's certainly wars over resources, uh, uh, war more modernly, I guess, war profiteering, uh, and I guess here and there, some minor other reasons. Um, certainly, I would think that early on, early war had to have been resource war, mostly. You know, uh, uh, we need, you know, they've got the they, they've got the best outcrop of bananas or whatever it might be, and we want them kind of thing. W would that, do you think that is the, the major driver of war early on, at least in Homo sapiens history? I think you've got to distinguish between the ultimate and the proximate reasons for war. So uh, at an ultimate level, meaning the, the sort of evolutionary long-term level, then you're probably right that uh, it is uh, competition over resources because if you win hostile interactions with your neighbors, you tend to be able to expand your area, maybe over a generation, uh, the area in which you live, and you get more access to resources and that will lead to more babies and, and so on, evolutionary advantage. But that doesn't mean that the proximate uh, reasons for um, these hostilities have got to be com competition over resources. And uh, part of the reason I say that is what we see in chimpanzees. And it's very dramatic with chimps. Here we got a species in which we know now that uh, throughout its range, they have, they have this capacity for attacking members of the neighboring groups and killing them. But there's no indication that they're doing so because of resource scarcity at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you do not see a fruiting tree on the boundary and the two groups meet and they have a fight. It's not like that. It's much more likely that if there is a resource effect, it is that when a group has got lots of resources, that's for the time when they go off and look for opportunities to kill the neighbors. Mm. Because they can spend the time without having to feed all day to go off to the neighbors because they know they can, they can easily eat up, uh, you know, fill their bellies when they come home. Um, and uh, so they've got the time and the energy and then they'll go off and just look for opportunities to see if they can pick somebody off. So what sense does this make? Well, it makes sense in the long term because if they can reduce the military strength of the opposition, then they will tend to get advantage. They'll tend to be able to go, you know, one kilometer further into that forest uh, without feeling nervous that they're going to be attacked themselves. Mm -hmm. So the, over the long term, they get an advantage in terms of access to resources, but it's not what precipitates the aggression. Yeah, so what you're saying basically is that we're, we're dealing with... Uh, uh, forces larger than the individual tribes, and there might be a conflict that's basically a, a blood feud between tribes, and maybe maybe uh, the two tribes got together and they had a feast, and one of the leaders says that I've been offended by something one of your people said. Now, they may not know, for example, that they're actually going to be feuding about a larger issue, but they use this offense, this honor, you know, honor killing and all that, as a reason without knowing what they're actually doing in the broader sense. Is that what I'm getting? Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, the, uh, the scholarly analyses of the reasons for war in small-scale society, it's almost all one thing. Well, the great majority is revenge. Mm. So, you know, well, what sense does that make? Because there's just a cycle, you know, let's stop doing revenge. But you can say that, you know, that is a motivation that um, promotes in people a desire to have an interaction, which if they win, then they're going to get an advantage. And so you know, revenge is a, just an, a series of exchanges of raids, mm. which, by the way, is pretty much the way that war works nowadays, yeah. a series of exchanges of raids. So it, it motivates people, you know, we hate those guys because they kill one of us, so let's go and kill one of them. 
But the ultimate um, consequence is very similar to what happens in chimpanzees. Yeah. Um, so uh, the person who would argue against this deep roots idea of war would say that culture somehow uh, is the thing that, that came and, and changed. You know, they have this idea of what, you know, we call the noble savage. And uh, I asked yesterday, uh, Michael Spaggett, uh, you know, well, what do these people who don't believe in this deep roots idea, what do they think was the trigger culturally? Because, you know, okay, when you have agriculture, as uh, I had mentioned, I think before we uh, started the show, you know, you can then have a warrior class and, you know, a warrior class, just like the military industrial complex here in the U.S., tends to want to just feed itself and keep itself going. Um, so I think the arguments from that side would be that, well, once you got a culture and you had specialized people, you had priests and you had medicine men and you had weavers and you had farmers and you had warriors, the warriors, once they know that they're going to get the respect and they're, you know, they're the ones that defend everyone. They're going to slowly but surely over generations increase their hold on that particular society, which makes them more warlike. So I think that's the counter argument. What would you say to that? And is that the right counter argument or am I wrong? I mean, it reminds me slightly of um, uh, Bear Branch's theory and of about uh, Chinese militarism, uh, where uh, if you have a group of, of young men who don't have access to women, then um, a good way to keep them occupied is to, to send them off to war. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm sure that you're right that there would be times when warriors might have some kind of influence on the dynamic, but I wouldn't think that that would be relevant to early warfare when the I'm surely the states were very hierarchical and uh, the decisions made at the top would be um, very independent of you know what these young bachelors were, were bothered about. Um, but uh, you know, the, the broad point surely is the, you know, if you're thinking about this question of uh, how culture affected war, that once you had agriculture generating um, larger populations, denser populations uh, in the start of cities, then the dynamic changes dramatically. And the, you know, the standard sort of critique of deep roots theory is that at that time you get um, patriarchy emerging because of um, male competition to own land in order to grow their fields. Um, and out of patriarchy and patriarchal ideology, you get war. That's the sort of, you know, the, the simple critique. So that's why you get much more evidence of war archaeologically starting around 10,000 years ago. Well, let me just ask you this, because just in listening to you, uh, I think back to a show I did two or three years ago uh, with a fellow, and we were debating the idea of polygamy. Um, well, not really debating. I was, I was, we were just putting it out there. And he, he came up with the idea, and I don't know if it was original to him. I don't recall off the top of my head, but you can look at the show if you go back in my archives, uh, that one of the negative things about polygamy, because I, I was arguing, well, if we're going to say that homosexuals can get married and adults can get married, why not have, you know, uh, polyandry and po polygamy and whatnot? And he said, that historically he thinks it's a bad idea because polygamy means that one that the chief gets most of the good women, the 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 noble class gets the remains, and the poor peasants don't get any of the women. And this makes for a very angry, you know, young male class that's at the bottom that need to get out their aggression. And so, if I recall correctly, he sort of tied the idea that uh, those societies that uh, favor this winner take all Genghis Khan po polygamous kind of you know concubinage and harem uh, features are more aggressive naturally because they have these young men with testosterone that just need to get out their aggression because they can't get the women. Um, the, does that figure in anything? Does that sound reasonable to you? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and by the way, uh, you know, one should also note that another very good reason uh, not to favor um, polygyny from the point of view of uh, societal well welfare is that it's brutal on women. 
because uh, you tend to get women uh, sort of locked up. Uh, you know, the wives of the, of the senior men uh, are, um, are treated very badly uh, because they need to be sequestered away from all of these men that don't have wives. And uh, the net result is, is a whole series of, of ghastly things that happen to women. But if you look at it more broadly across, um, you know, across the world, and people have done, done uh, analyses uh, looking at the whole world, and countries where you have more polygyny have uh, higher rates of death of women and childbirth and um, all sorts of bad things happening to women. So just uh, these last few things we've been talking about, we've been talking about group violence. Um, what are the individual markers for, say, individual violence, especially in males? And do do societies that have more individually violent individuals, are they ne necessarily more warlike in group? Uh, because we often hear about the idea that uh, um, the, the, the mask effect, that when you are part of a crowd, you're more likely, you know, to do negative uh, mild things than you would individually, that you're able to, being part of the group, you get that group psychology thing going. So is there a, is there a demarcation line between uh, violent individuals and an at-large violent society? Do they necessarily go hand in hand? I don't think they necessarily go hand in hand, but um, there, is, uh, there is some information showing that Societies that have high population growth rates, um, say, you know, 4%, uh, 6%, 8% uh, population growth rates, um, have a, a greater tendency for violence, both within and um, between groups. Mm. And the logic here is that uh, what this does is to put stress on the uh, males in the next generation because they want to live a life at least as good as their fathers but now you've got more people sharing the same pot and so there's more competition among those men and uh, so they fight more and the fighting can emerge in, in various different ways but i can't think of any data that specifically looks at that question um, of uh, you know how well correlated the within group fighting is with between group fighting and and i wouldn't be surprised if there's not a very strong relationship partly because the type of aggression that is used in the two contexts within group and between group tends to be different within group it's mostly reactive aggression and between group it's mostly proactive aggression i was going to get to that next though. so can you explain the difference reactive aggression is losing your temper when you're threatened by someone who annoys you mm -hmm. Uh, proactive aggression is designing a plan to go out and do something that you think will give you advantage. Mm. So it's having a goal. You know, uh, I, I really don't like that guy who I think has been looking at my wife too much. Uh, I'm going to go and take him out. Um, you know, whatever the reason is, it's a, it's a planned attack that might um, be developed uh, in a short period, but not enacted until the agent thinks that he can get away with the attack, with the aggression, um, very cheaply. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a really critical thing, observation, because that's different from reactive aggression. With reactive aggression, you just get into a fight and you don't care if people hurt you. Uh, that, that's not what's important. You just want to get rid of the threatening stimulus, the annoying guy, the, mm -hmm. the, the one who, who says your mother is a, uh, is a whore. Yeah. Uh, but in the case of proactive aggression, it's all very deliberate. You choose your moment. And if that moment never comes, if you never see the opportunity to attack at very low cost to yourself, then you don't do it. Mm. So this is you know, one of the reasons why uh, people who fear the deep war, roots of war theory I think are mistaken because they often worry about it as if it means that war is inevitable. Yeah. But war, since it mostly uses proactive aggression, depends on opportunities to enact it. It depends on a leader, a country, whatever, 
thinking that they can get away with this major attack. Yeah. And it's conceivable that we can design a world in which we really do reduce those opportunities to so few that war can essentially go away. Well, yesterday with the Spagat, I had mentioned uh, mutually assured destruction in the Cold War. Would the arms race between the Soviets and the Americans have been considered reactive aggression? Well, no. Um, it, it, this is all, it's all proactive aggression that doesn't happen. Mm. Right? I mean, you, you build a nuclear bomb in the, with the thought that you might use it, uh -huh. but uh, there's never an opportunity to use it. And why is there never an opportunity to use it? It's because of mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. That plus, um, you know, we nowadays have a kind of moral norm, which is uh, to say that people will be so horrified if a country actually uses nuclear arms that there would be a very intense um, response from the rest of the world. So this is, you know, this is a splendid thing from the point of view of the theory of war. Mm -hmm. Theory of war does not say people have to go to war. It says they go to war if they think they can get away with it. Well, nowadays, no one thinks they can get away with using nuclear arms. So that suppresses the use of nuclear arms. Of course, the you know, nuclear arms, the, the real danger of them is not the, the use in war. The real danger of them is the possibility of an accident. Yeah. I want to pick up on something I had mentioned in yesterday's show with Michael Spaggett, and that's the idea that is war an intellectualized conceit? And I say that because uh, I gave the example yesterday of uh, uh, social insects like termites and ants warring with each other, interspecies, and then interspecies uh, ants warring with each other, uh, how dolphin packs uh, uh, attack and war with each other, and apes, of course, we mentioned. Um, is would those things do you think be considered war? I mean, you you had mentioned uh, you know the chimps. Would that technically be defined as war? Is that just animal aggression? I mean, people vary in their definition. Uh, you can find lots and lots of different definitions, and some of them would include animals, and some of them would not. Uh, you know, common definition is um, uh, aggression. Uh, lethal aggression uh, involving um, groups on either side, and um, uh, so that that could include some of the animal cases. But uh, obviously, if you include weapons, then uh, which a lot of people do, uh, then war is just uniquely human. But yeah, so regardless of that definition, it's quite clear that uh, the pattern of coalitions of sometimes males, sometimes females, depending on your species. Um, being willing to uh, make deliberate attacks on neighboring groups uh, to kill them. Uh, you know, that, that, that happens in a number of different animals. Um, the noble savage idea, I think, seems to be behind a lot of the pushback against this deep roots uh, idea. Um, now that started, well, it may have started before Rousseau, but he, I think, coined the term. Um, do, do you see that as being one of uh, the reasons that people push back against the idea that uh, uh, group violence, at least, uh, is ingrained within us? Well, I think when people are using whatever, um, whatever evidence they can, and, and if a moral philosopher from the 18th century uh, comes up with a useful phrase, then they'll, they'll, they'll use it too. But I mean, you know, Rousseau's ideas were so different from the kinds of things that people are talking about nowadays uh, that they're really not intellectually continuous. You know, he, he was imagining a time when individuals wandered around uh, without a society at all. Uh -huh. So you know, nowadays, of course, we know that all of our close relatives, um, well, the African ones, uh, do have societies. They don't have to. In the Asian ones, the orangutans, they don't have a society. They're just a, a bunch of individuals. Uh -huh. But, um, but we come from a line in which there were societies. And so you know, the actual notion of a noble savage is, is nonsense, clearly. But whether or not, uh, you know, regardless of that, people are drawn to finding evidence of, um, of a peaceful past because they erroneously think that that is a way to relieve us of pessimism. 
Uh, what is your take on Steven Pinker's uh, ideas in this? Uh, we I mentioned yesterday's show uh, about uh, the Better Angels book uh, that Pinker had, that violence as a whole, uh, both individually and societally, uh, is getting less. Do you agree with that or not, and why? I totally agree with this. I mean, the, I think the data are very strong. Um, but, you know, you have to understand that the data he used for punter gatherer data mostly come from a paper that uh, some colleagues and I wrote. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Pinker and I are, are very much, uh, you know, we go back, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the notion of that broad sweep uh, being true. I think wherever I've looked in detail at the data, uh, I'm totally persuaded that the, the big trend uh, worldwide has been for a reduction in amount of violence. Both cases, both within groups and between groups. Um, how about the, the idea of privatized war? Um, we see, I mean, in the 20th century, we had a lot of, and even go to the, to the 19th century with the race for Africa, we saw a lot of what we might call proxy wars. Nowadays, you see a lot of times, like here in Afghanistan with the pullout, uh, I think there were as many, if not maybe a little bit more, private contractors that were being killed. Uh, what do you see as the future of war and uh, with artificial intelligence and the idea that we can have drone strikes and maybe have, you know, android or kind of uh, warriors rather than human beings? Does that sort of, is that sort of like when you're 20,000 feet above and drop a bomb, you don't care uh, about, you know, what happens when the bombs hit down below? Uh, is that sort of making it more of a video game thing? And do you think that will increase war in the sense that you're more detached from the the, the results of war, the real results? Well, yes, probably. Um, I think the detachment, the important thing about the detachment is not so much uh, the traditional view that uh, people are inhibited from killing by... Uh, being in the presence of their victim, um, you know, I'm sure that has some role, but rather less than many people think, because there's lots of evidence from descriptions of war at all sorts of levels that when hostilities are there to the point where soldiers or, or men, or sometimes women, are fighting for their lives, then uh, they really do lose a sense of empathy for the their opponents, mm -hmm. uh, and you just feel joy at killing. I think the more important thing about the detachment is the fact that uh, people can do it without any sense of personal risk to themselves. Yeah, and that, that's that's what makes it dangerous. So, you know, for me, the big picture about war is that uh, human creativity is such that we will always be developing new and terrifying weapons. And uh, those terrifying weapons will be uh, everything from, uh, you know, better kinds of, of nuclear weapons and delivery systems for them to things like um, better systems for uh, giving diseases uh, to yeah. uh, opposing groups. Um, and, uh, and, and who knows what, uh, you know, once we have artificial intelligence entering the picture. So there will always be new weapons being developed. And so we always knew, need, need new defences. And the great hope for the future is that the defences uh, will be up to uh, the, the weapons. So with global warming being the dominant, uh, the dominant issue probably for the rest of this century, if not beyond, um, do you see what a lot of people see, uh, water wars, resource wars, uh, with uh, nations uh, losing lots of their territory, refugees on the move. Um, do you see a lot of uh, war between countries, or will there be more? Do you think more civil unrest? Because it seems since the big World War II, uh, it's been mostly civil wars. It hasn't been many, you know, major powers uh, at war. Well, I mean, you know, when you think of war from an anthropological perspective. Um, and we think about it uh, within and between groups. Groups should not be the same thing as nations. And as you say, you know, there's a lot of civil war, but that's still war. Mm -hmm. uh, it's war between uh, two groups that are slightly less well defined than, uh, you know, wars that have uh, are a result of the 
groups that were set up uh, following the Treaty of Westphalia. Um, what's the answer? Um, yeah, I can, I can well imagine that there will be more wars between uh, groups that are not nations. And sometimes those will be civil wars and sometimes there will be wars that involve uh, groups, you know, like the Kurds or someone, you know, who, who cross a, a bunch of different nations. Um, assuming that humankind uh, does get through uh, global warming without a nuclear war ensuing and, you know, 150 or so years from now on the other end, uh, do you see that uh, a continuing uh, domestication, self-domestication of the human animal? And what, if, if you were to try to envision a, a future, and I know it, it's it's very uh, uh, sci-fi like, uh, what, what do you think is the end game where will humans uh, ever not be constantly at war with each other? Or do we get out into the cosmos, you think, and oh, now we don't have to fight against each other because now we have this new race of people from three star systems over so we can continue our warring ways. Uh, I mean, what, uh, again, this is just, just speculative. Yeah, it's fun to play with ideas yeah. and, and, and I imagine that most ideas will fall, uh, will be sort of taken over uh, in some sense by AI and by the fusion of AI with humanity and human brains. So I can't imagine uh, how that's going to work. Yeah. But the, uh, the one point I would offer is that um, the stability of the human species uh, is uh, would be greatly facilitated if we didn't have males. I think that uh, the elimination of of the male sex uh, and the male gender uh, would be a splendid idea. And of course, you know, the initial thought about that is, is might be, uh, oh, you know, you want, you want to go around killing males? No, not at all. There's no need to kill anybody. You know, I think it would be wonderful if the world could come to an agreement that um, women would only bear daughters. Uh, because, you know, it's quite clear that uh, the degree of hostility uh, that uh, men are willing to use is much greater than the degree of hostility women are meant to use, or are adapted to using. Women are perfectly capable of violence, they're perfectly capable of, of fighting in all sorts of ways. But the risks when you have two males or multiple males uh, fighting are much greater than when you have females fighting. Mm. So, you know, I, I'd love to uh, be told uh, that uh, in a thousand years time uh, there will be no males left and there will be an all-female species like some whiptail lizards and uh, uh, you know a few species that you find around the place. But now now that would uh, be a, a thing that if we did have these hypothetical kind of aliens that we encountered males might all of a sudden become a very hot property for, for their violence to defend the species don't you think? Well it's possible, um, but, you know, I, I think I would actually in many ways prefer to be defended by females. Um, when females are up against it, uh, in defense of their children, you know, uh, in defense of the motherland, you know, they can, they can do what's necessary. So I, I, I'll, I'll take that risk any time. So do you, do you see any upsides, though, with... Uh... Uh, the human propensity uh, for war or violence. I mean, certainly technology probably has benefited from it. Uh, a lot of devices that were created for war have other uses. Uh, uh, but overall, would you say it's a negative uh, effect on human Yeah, history? absolutely. It's, it's overwhelmingly negative. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not just the... Uh, the, the number of deaths uh, and uh, injuries that, that result from war, uh, but also the amount of time that is spent in, in a basically unproductive activity. Mm. So you say that war has led to um, you know, various kinds of useful inventions and so on, and I'm sure that's right. But on the other hand, if uh, instead of uh, committing war, you know, people had just committed all that energy to exploration, then just as the space race has produced some uh, interesting uh, innovations, 
you know, the, the move into space has uh, has had uh, impacts on, you know, the development of uh, the things we, we use in our daily lives. Well, without well, the Cold War, would we have had the space race? Uh, I don't know if we would, but, but I'm saying that, yeah. that I can imagine a, 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 you know, a history in which exploration was more important than war. Yeah. And uh, exploration would be part of uh, going to space. So uh, is there anything else that uh, you'd like to touch upon, either from your book or from uh, the whole idea we've been talking about that uh, I might have missed? Um, no, I mean, you know, I think the point I would want to emphasize is that uh, the deep roots of war theory um, is, uh, is, I think, you know, very much a philosophy that is driven by uh, the fear that people will uh, be pessimistic if they think that uh, our species has got a biological component to its warfare. And the reason I think that that's a bad idea is partly because I just think it's wrong, um, but also because if it pushes people away from thinking deeply about war, then it means you're less creative. And the way to, to address this problem is to take it seriously, you know, to acknowledge that um, throughout history, people have always committed war. The prehistory evidence is strong for war. The comparative evidence for other species is, is strong. And that if we want to be, um, do something constructive, the constructive thing is not to just throw away all that evidence and pretend it isn't there. The constructive thing to do is to grapple with it and think positively about how to avert war. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is uh, your future uh, endeavors going to be uh, in this topic? Uh, uh, as an anthropologist, uh, uh, are you going to go on to some other ideas or what? What? what is your next outline for your book going to be, your next book? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I think that um, the relationships between the sexes uh, the um, the patriarchy that that infects uh, humans uh, is an issue that we pay too little attention to, mm. and it's possible that I'll I'll go in that direction and think about um, about how we can further abrade uh, the patriarchal tendencies because the patriarchal tendencies you know they're related to what we're talking about uh, they're dangerous they're a bad idea. Well, I, I will say, if uh, if you do get your way and uh, there are no males in a thousand years, I'd say invest in the dildo uh, manufacturing sector <laughs> <laughs> because that's going to be big for women in a thousand years. <laughs> well, uh, it was a great talk. Uh, I will link to your your uh, university page and also I'll link to the Amazon page for, uh, for your last book. And uh, anyway, a terrific talk. So thank you for spending an hour or so speaking with me. Great, really nice to meet you and congratulations on all you do.